What's up, everyone? This is Peter Neal from GSP REI, and you're listening to the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. This podcast is designed to help both active and passive real estate investors take their real estate investing game to the next level so that you can grow a successful real estate investing business or find out what to look for when you're investing passively in a real estate investment business. Let's get right into it. All right. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. I am joined today by just my one partner, Wade Carroll. Wade, how are you doing today? I'm good. Awesome. So you you look like you're in a different place there. What do you got behind you there? You got the, uh, looks like a, a river or a lake and some really nice uh, some trees working and some mountains. Yeah, my... Uh... I got a new, I got a new computer and uh, I mean, I, I have a zoom account, right? So I had different backgrounds saved in my okay. zoom account. So I figured it didn't really matter which computer I'm using, but anyway, I <laughs> no longer have my old backups, which used to be, you know, some mountains out in glacier. Uh, so you uploaded them in there. They, that wasn't, I've never done that before. Yeah, did, did well, you? I mean, I don't have a very attractive background, nor do I have a green screen. For sure. Uh, so I look sort of stupid. But <laughs> anyway, that was a, <laughs> this was a back, that, that is a, a Flathead River. And we, we float and fish it a lot. So that's actually a big river that runs through the valley here. Um, okay. So that's like in act, Montana. So you actually like took that picture. Were you, were you on a raft or okay? Yeah. Wow. Very nice. So, well, that's kind of the stuff we're we're going to talk about today, and uh, I think we should take this opportunity maybe to get a little bit into your story and uh, how you got to where you are today and that kind of stuff. So, maybe we'll start at the beginning. What, uh, where did Wade grow up? Where was uh, where where do you call home in that sense? I grew up in Colorado, a little a little town in western the western slope uh, near Telluride. Uh, Mount Rose, Colorado. Okay. So I was born in Texas, but we moved when I was two to Colorado. So yeah, about 25 years in, in Colorado. Wow. Okay. And what was that like? Was it, is it rural there or were you, were you skiing and on the mountains or like what yeah. was it, regular suburb or what would that look like? No, no. It, it's a small town. There was like 7,000 people when we moved, uh, uh, it's a, just a beautiful farming community. Uh, they're known for their their sweet onions and uh, and their sweet corn. And then to the south is all of the San Juan Mountains. So pretty much from anywhere in the valley, you have a just a radical view of the San Juans. And then we were about an hour from Telluride. So yeah, we would uh, routinely uh, skip school for ski days growing okay. up. What did school look like? How many like how many people were in your class like in high school? 150. Wow. And I barely made the top quarter. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> what now did did your family have a farm? Like did you do any of that kind of stuff or uh like how did oh, oh, yeah. you do you raise cattle now and and stuff like that, right? Like is, is that was that did you learn that growing up or how did you get into that? Yeah, my my dad grew up on a poor farm in Texas. So so when he looks at you know the business of farming, uh, cattle and chickens and horses, uh, it it just looks like work to him. But he married a city girl who loves all that stuff. So whether he likes it or not, yeah, we had a bunch of cattle, we had horses, we had chickens, and and yeah, I I got into it. Uh, I I really got into cattle. I showed them all over the country for for many years. Uh, but what fascinated me about it was the, the genetic side. You know, if you raise and show cattle, it, it matters what the mama and the papa look like, how they perform. And, uh, and, the and give me a little detail as as a suburban kid from the suburbs of Philadelphia. That means absolutely nothing to me. What what is a show cattle and and how do they perform? Like, what what do, what do you mean by that? 
Well, you're you're asking pretty big questions, pretty broad <laughs> questions. <laughs> I don't even know what what questions I'm asking to be honest. That that's how like foreign I am to it. Well, it it depends what you're after, right? If if you're we're talking about um, you know milk cows, you're looking for yeah. a different type of animal versus. Uh, you know, a, a market animal, which we'd call you, that's going to be butchered for, you know, steak and hamburger, right? They, okay. they have very different characteristics. And then you can go a step further. And, and eat. so even if you're, you're dealing with milk cattle, there's various breeds of those milk cattle, each with different characteristics. And those, those purebred breeders of say a Holstein or whatever, they want to maintain that that Holstein ideal versus a, a market guy who's you know the the end result of a market animal essentially is food uh, primarily. Um, so you got the Angus breeders, you got the Hereford breeders, you got the Santa Catrus breeders, and and they're all trying to maintain that specific breed characteristics. But the truth is, when you're out there at a feed lot you know, calves that are being fattened up for slaughter, they're very seldom purebreds. They're almost always some mixture of various breeds. And again, the uh, the developers or the growers of these cattle are they're all they're all seeking that ideal calf and and what he looks like. Uh, and and there's and and then when you you try to apply that to the show ring, um in a lot of ways, it's like a, a, not a beauty pageant, but what are the what are the shows where uh, that you're you're looking at the clothing of these women, uh, yeah. like a fashion show, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the the chicks that are walking down that aisle, they're usually wearing something completely bizarre that you'd never <laughs> see. You wouldn't wear in real life. Yeah. Right. So that, that kind of is what happens in the show ring. You're trying to get the judge's attention, so you're you're breeding this animal that that has these certain exceptional qualities that don't necessarily translate into the slaughterhouse in the market, okay. and and so the cycle of these influences uh, kind of battle, huh. and uh, luckily or hopefully providentially, right now the two have kind of converged. So if you look at a market animal in the show ring today, it is more, it is more similar to a, a proper calf being fatted for slaughter. So it's, it's good. Now, when I was showing, for some reason, the show ring was looking for these very tall, very long legged, they look like racehorses. So, and they, they were influenced by a couple breeds like the Kidney and, and, and the main Anjou to throw in some, some meat and, and so we were we were literally walking out there with these racehorse cattle that you know they they're going to weigh you know 1900 pounds by the time they're fattened up they're inefficient you got to feed them so much food to get them fat okay. and then when you slaughter them they're like you know 18 feet long they're dragging along the slaughterhouse floor cuz the slaughterhouse isn't built for such massive animals so but there was like a decade of that um Anyway, and that so that obviously isn't working, and they're now coming down to this more moderate sized animal that's efficient that you know gains so many pounds for every pound you feed it or whatever. So, but there's this process, and in the meantime, you got to try to you know, and the, you're even looking at the judge, you're trying to figure out what judge is going to be at this show. Does he like this type of animal or that type of animal? Am I going to bring this calf? Or am I going to bring that calf? It's I, it's not stupid. I love it, but it's yeah. stupid. Yeah, no, it's well, it's fascinating. I mean, to, like I said, to me, it's a window into it's just a, an unknown world. And, uh, you know, growing up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, like I was, uh, we always went to Lancaster. You know, I mean, so that was like farm country and it was always cattle. And, but they were nothing more than just something you'd see on the side of the road, you know, and they'd either, what do you used to say? If they're laying down, it's going to rain. You know I mean, that kind of thing. And that was it. You know what I mean? Like I never thought about, I never thought about, you know, everything you're talking about there it is absolutely fascinating. And we could probably go down that rabbit hole. I have so many questions, but um, let's get back on track a little bit to talk about yeah, well, how, how you guys, I, I asked the questions. Yeah. <laughs> but 
that's fascinating. You know, I mean, like I said, we could we could talk about that for a while, but I w- I want to talk about you know your your story and uh, and that's just one piece of it, right? So, um, what where you went to uh, Texas A and M or? Mm-hmm. So what uh, what did you study? Like, what was your what did you think you were going to do back in those days? Okay, so there's going to be a few stories um, that that aren't going to help out my cause or yours. So, and this will be one of them. Okay. So, people will question my intelligence, as as they should. Uh, yes, yeah, so I went. I went to Texas A and M. I was a finance major. Um, no. I do not have a finance degree. Uh, uh, a long and unflattering story. Um, but yes, I I went to Texas A and M. I was a finance major, and I I changed my major my senior year. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I I I blame my folks for not giving me any guidance, and it's really not their fault. <laughs> I'm just a knucklehead. But I I didn't understand. Like I, number one, I don't like school. I was constantly distracted, doing other things, uh, still messing with my cattle. So I was gone a lot, and uh, whatever. I'm a dumb kid. But I had a, I had a number of. Uh, you know, uncles and whatnot that were in the the banking industry. And I that's really all I thought finance was. I'm gonna go work at a bank. And that was not interesting to me at all. Mm. And the closer I got to the realization that I'm gonna graduate and work in a bank, I'm like, I'm out. So backing up into the cattle and the birds that we raised, I was really more into genetics. And uh I, anyway, I did a lot of work in in that front, so I thought I'm going to go back towards something more science, something more medical, and uh, I ended up doing an internship at the Heart Institute uh, in Spokane, Washington. So I was, I, I've radically changed over to physiology, thinking, okay, I could work in a hospital, be a, a cardiac tech, uh, you know, something like that. I, I didn't like to say pre med. Uh, but that's kind of where I was headed. I, I, w- I would being a doctor was never, never in the cards. And at this play, at this point in time, I just wanted out. The fastest way to a degree, um, and, the, and the good thing is, all the math that I was taking in finance, most of it worked for the physiology. We did a lot of biomechanics, so it's you know you're taking engineering calculus and and stuff like that. So, uh, but yeah, as long as I was in college, I should have two degrees. <laughs> so you did go down that path and, and you got a degree in what was in what physio- was it exactly? oh, okay. physiology yeah. okay. biomechanics okay yeah. and then when you got out of school where did you you continue to work in that space for a little bit or? Well, i never i never worked in that space I, the most i worked in that space was <laughs> Jesus, the internship. so, <laughs> so what yeah, happened, see, what's the story there so you, you get out with that degree and uh You'd think a normal person would go down that path of working in that that industry. What happened with you? Normal person, yeah. Um, (laughs) So several things had happened. Uh, As I was approaching graduation, I realized I need to start selling cattle. Um, My folks were moving back. Well, my folks were moving back to Texas, and I no longer was using their land to support this herd of cattle I had. So I needed to sell them. So I started liquidating cattle. So that they could move, and they ended up in Texas. And uh, my dad's background is um, he's in and out of the hotel business. So right as I was graduating, we we found a small little mom and pop hotel in South Texas, and uh, and we bought it, and it was nice. I had some money from my cattle, so I bought in as a partner, um, and I managed it. I renovated the whole place. And uh, we started doing that for a few years. We ended up buying one in Arkansas and then one up in North Texas, uh, the Panhandle. So, um, like, just so I have like the mental picture of these hotels. You know, I mean, what did they, what did they look like? What were the features? And then, like, what did you guys do? Were you operators? Were you, like, were you answering yeah, yeah. phones and that kind well, of stuff? No, you, yeah, you have an office staff and you have housekeepers and usually a okay. maintenance guy. Um. <clears throat> So let's see, this was like uh, middle 90s, 95, 96, somewhere in there. And uh, so these were these were best Western motels. So they'd be limited okay. service. Most of them are outdoor corridor. 
And and the reason we we went like dad had a motel in Colorado. It was it was not a franchise. It was just a private hotel, you know, whatever, 70 units. This is nice, but we didn't like the restaurant side of things. So we'd we'd look for motels with no restaurants, so limited service. But but in the 90s, Best Western uh had a poor reputation. So they they uh, did a radical uh standard change. So they said from now on, a Best Western hotel needs to have these amenities, this quality, you know, whatever. So and at the time it was one of the largest franchises in the country. And and after that, those extreme changes, almost half of the prop, the best westerns at that time, uh, were put on probation, which means they're they're this close to being kicked out. They're going to cut down the flag, and you'll have to be an independent. You can no longer be a best western. So we took that as an opportunity to find potential, and then do major renovations in order to meet those new and higher standards. Uh, and it worked. We did that three times but then just a few years later right around 2000 you remember when the dot-com bust happens was that 2000 2001 i think around then yeah i would have been pretty young but i i do i can still remember those that those times on television and things like that so yeah yeah and then it was one. it was weird because it it directly affected uh long-term uh, real estate place it was like people were fleeing wall street and trying to put their money in something that was a you know a, a passive return and so suddenly all the hotels that we were finding and and our margins were were wonderful we were very happy with this what we we're doing we couldn't find anything because I mean, every motel is getting bought up across the country okay. so kind of the whole dot-com bust actually killed the the motel business as we knew it mm -hmm. and we start thinking well maybe there's there's better places to make more money so that was kind of the end of that we, we sold two of them we sat on one for i don't know probably five or six more years but because it was close mm -hmm. easy to deal with but, but yeah that was i learned a lot but i was you know young and naive <laughs> What would you say was was some of the biggest learning experiences from those days? Those were my first real big construction jobs, right? When you're, uh, you know, you got a hundred rooms, so you're going to need a hundred air conditioners. A hundred rooms need to be painted. A hundred rooms with the uh, carpet, you know, things like that. And then, and you can't shut down the whole motel. Yeah. You do it so yeah pieces. It, yeah so you you shut down pieces of it at a time or building by building or, or whatever but now your income is compromised so you you really have to budget and plan ahead and crack a whip make sure things get done and you can shut down the next wing and and then reoccupy this wing and so it's just it was high level uh organization to get it to make it work and was it hard to find contractors so that could do that kind of scale in the areas that you were that the hotels were in? Or this doesn't it doesn't sound like they were necessarily in like metropolitan type areas. No, they, like that, yeah, no? these were they were mostly rural. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I don't recall it being super hard. I I do remember the one we we had in Arkansas. That one was diff difficult, and I actually put the bid out nationwide. Uh, and I got a group, uh, I forgot where they came from, but they were way out of state. But that was a sizable uh, building there, complex. So we, we had a lot to do. And it gets wicked cold in the winter. So we had a, a pretty narrow window to get it done. But uh, yeah, the others, we, we, did, we did it slower and we mostly did local local paint, painters, local, uh, you know, you're, you're buying a carpet by the roll. So you, you, you kind of have to use a local guy for that because you need a, a forklift just to move around that sort of stuff, contract with him to lay it all. And, you know, you figure stuff out. So after the, the dot com bust and, you know, wall street starts to look for deals in the, 
yeah, real estate sector and all, and the margins start getting cut in the hotel business. What did you guys do after that? Well, at this whole time, I, I was a securities trader. Um, I started trading in uh, 95 or 96. So we were living in Schulenburg, Texas at the time. That's about 90 miles west of Houston. So I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning and driving hour and a half to two hours into Houston. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, we, we had an, an office there in the Marathon Oil Tower. Uh, yeah, and it was it was wonderful. I absolutely loved trading. Um, getting up at four was not so great, but it was cool because we're done by two, you know, so I could I could head back home and miss rush hour. And uh, so we were trading sub substantial transactions. Uh, it's probably seven years there. But so that that was to me my main my main job. Once I renovated the hotels, they kind of work on their own. You know, you you have the front desk staff, you always have a manager, she's, you know, making deposits. And so it wasn't like for a young kid, I was bored out of my mind with the hotels. When, once they were finished, I was, there's nothing to do. So, so we started trading um, and that, that went well, but again, the whole dot com thing kind of wrecked that. There was a, what a was the strategy there just to kind of paint the picture for what you were doing with, with, uh, with trade and securities. Uh, it was basically all NASDAQ stuff, uh, very short term, but high volume. Uh, everything was, you know, one or 2000 share blocks. Uh, we, we actually had the NASDAQ node that was pumped in. The, the, so our speed of quotes was better than anyone in the whole state. But we would do like a given day, I would do 150 transactions, round trips in and out. You know, you're just buying something for you know, two or three minutes, sometimes mm -hmm. seconds, just making a spread. You try to do it as many times a day as you can. Uh, How did you learn that business? Seems so different than the hotels and, and your background in college and the classes and stuff like that. Did it come out of the finance world or did you have someone that introduced you to my, that? Or My dad, he, he sold his first motel when he was pretty young. So he was effectively retired when I was a kid. So he was always in and out of the stock market. So for probably, I'd say most of my childhood, that's really where we made money is dad just trading. So I would watch him. And even in college, I had my own trading account. So dad and I are always on the phone in college and I'm picking his brain. And so that was always fascinating to me. And then of course, when, when computers came out and the internet and you could do this so fast, uh, man, it's, it was a drug <clears throat> for sure. It was, it was really neat, but. So what was the effect that the dot-com error had on the trading? Well, so, so wall street didn't like all of us. We're day traders, right? But we, we were a big shop. Uh, we were block trading. They were, the, they were one of the first day trading firms that kind of made the big splash. I don't know if you remember all that, but th they were the first large uh day trading firm they were on the cover of ink magazine back in the day and uh anyway i was i was one of their first traders i traded there in their office for probably three years and then there's a group of us traders that did most of the activity there and we spun off and opened our own shop in in marathon in the marathon oil tower <laughs> and uh so we, were just, we cut our fees by two thirds. So it was just a, it was a way to become more efficient, cost efficient with our transactions. And that's when it really got fun. But the, the, the whole day trading thing became so huge that the, the larger market makers did not like it because we were, we were narrowing those spreads where a normal market maker might be playing with a, say a three, eight spread. And then a day trader comes in here and cuts it to an eighth or a quarter bypassing the market maker. Um, they didn't like it. So they began pressuring um, basically all the, the Dow, the powers that be to make it more difficult for us. So one of the ways they did it is went to decimalization. <laughs> so instead of trading in 16th, eighths, quarters, it's, it's, you know, it, you can get to 
point zero zero in a number. So what ended up happening is it became twice as risky to make half of the money. So we stuck it out for a few more years and you're like, you know, I, this is a lot more difficult than it used to be. And at that point I thought I could do better on my own. So I, I, that's when I got into real estate, but the whole trading thing is still, I, I love it, but uh, you can also get your butt beat pretty badly. <laughs> so talk to me about the, your, your journey into real estate there. How did that, uh, how did that happen? Because it's you—you uh, you had some background with, with the hotels, obviously, and finding them, and uh, the construction side, and uh, operations, and things like that. So, what was your, uh, what was your first kind of foray into real estate in, in that sense, and uh, where'd you go from there? Yeah. So, with the the background of the hotels, I I understood financing, which is important. You know, real estate is expensive, so you, you needed a way to make sure you had the money to get a transaction done. Construction obviously helps, but by, I was no expert at that point. But, and this is just one of those serendipity things. Um, I'm, I'm trading in Houston, so that happens to be the city that I'm in. And our office was pretty much downtown. So to get from the suburbs to downtown, uh, it's, an, it's an, at least an hour. And the city of Houston just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the whole inner city. So downtown Houston is not like Philly. You know, Philadelphia, there's there's shopping downtown. Uh, there's apartments. There's a lot of people that live downtown. That's not the case in Houston. It's like everything closes at five, right? When when the business day is over, all the restaurants are closed. People don't live there. They're all in the suburbs. So it's a very different kind of feel. But as these suburbs kept growing and the commute times were increasing, around that whole 2000, 2001, 2002, it kind of be started collapsing back in. The, the communities immediately around downtown were horrible. They were all the wards. Um, there were the, the tightest ones around the city. Most of them were just vacant lots now, uh, crack houses. Uh, it was just a, a huge mess. And then somebody with a lot of nerve found a lot that he was able to buy and built a three-story townhouse with shared walls. And that kind of started it off. Uh, it was a huge success. He could now walk to work, which you couldn't do prior to this. The, the problem is there's so many poor buildings, so many vacant lots there. And then there are you know, decades of back taxes. And that's the other thing that this, had I been living anywhere else, this wouldn't have worked. But uh, Houston is one of the few counties that they foreclose on their own tax liens. They do not sell tax liens. Like Dallas, if you get delinquent so far in your taxes, they sell the lien to, you know, and anyone can buy it. In, in Houston, they foreclose themselves. So speaking with the the treasury of the treasurer of the time, uh, he said if they if they were pushing all the foreclosures as fast as they could, it would it would take them 20 years to solve the problem in Houston. So it's, it was a massive problem. And of course, they weren't pushing foreclosure in those inner city wards because at that time there, there was no value. You know, okay, we we foreclosed on this 50 by a hundred lot that's worth nothing. You know, who are we going to sell it to? So they weren't even prosecuting. And the tax rates were so low, you, you could find one of those lots with 20 years of back taxes and it's you know, five grand, you know, there's, there's no taxes on it. So it wasn't worth anything to them to, to prosecute. So I started researching. <clears throat> so I, I would trade all day and then I'd come back to the house in Schulenberg and I'm, I'm online just researching tax records, uh, trying to figure out a way to get in there. Another cool thing in Texas is you can adverse possess property, which means if there's a vacant piece of land, you can claim it. And there's a, a process you have to go through to claim it, but primarily you have to start maintaining it. So we'll mow, we'll mow it. Uh, and yeah, it has to be an, an obvious claiming of it. So we would make it obvious by, we would maintain it. We'd build a fence around it. And we'd put a big old sign right in the middle of it that says, this is mine. 
Okay. And my name and my number. So if, if anyone said I, it's not mine, it's theirs, they would call me and we'd have a discussion. And frankly, I would like that because now I know who owns the property. Because what's happening is you, you get in you get in the the tax records and you realize the guy that actually owned it died in seventy three, and he has four kids. You know, you're like, well, great. Where are these kids? And you start looking up these kids. So there, there's a way to get the title. Uh, and that's what we were doing. And that, that actually became a, a business. Uh, we had a full-time private investigator just seeking heirs of deceased people. So I'd spend two or three days. Sounds in like the formation of the note business, even back in those days, or you're, at least you're learning things that you utilize today back then, kind oh, of yeah. in the foundation. Oh, yeah. Hundred percent. We and we still use a lot of this now with the Heckams we're trading now. The first thing you got to do is figure out the estate. Who are the kids? Where are they? Do they know what's going on? And so yeah, it's a lot of digging and and researching to find people. And that's exactly what we were doing. We'd spend two or three days a week in public records, and then two or three days a week driving, looking for more properties. So what would you do? Like, so one, once you, you, you got the property, what would you do with it? Or, and would, would they it. sell it to you or like, what would they? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a negotiation, right? <clears throat> like the, the, one of the first ones I did, uh, it's an old man that, that passed away and I, I tracked down his daughter and he just, he had a nice corner lot. Uh, it was a double lot, which I liked, uh, but he had, uh, I don't know, let's say 17,000 in back taxes. So I finally tracked down his daughter and I, I, called her she was not even aware that he owned this lot and i said it's, it's going to the tax sale there's seventeen thousand in back taxes do you do you want the property she's like no and i can't afford the, the back taxes so i offered her 10 grand and i said i'll take the taxes and i'll write you a check for ten thousand bucks she was ecstatic so now my all-in cost is twenty seven thousand okay. bucks so there was a struck a little structure on there i cleaned it mowed it down uh, put a fence on it, and the following year I sold it for 120 grand, just the dirt, just the dirt to a developer. Yeah, they so we did the... that. We did that times a lot, a lot. And then if I couldn't find an heir, then we'd adverse possess it. So back in the day, we had 150 properties in downtown Houston that we were actively adverse possessing. Wow, and there's a whole process to go through. Uh, you know, to to make that proper. But at the end of that five years, uh, you sue for trespass to try title. Okay. And the state will effectively give you a sheriff's deed on it if you've performed for those five years as you're supposed to. But <laughs> so, yeah, it okay. was always better if we could find an heir and cut a deal because then we'd get the property. Sure. You know, yeah. Today. Yeah. But there was a ton of developers down there and they were they weren't doing this. They were just hunting for vacant land that was for sale. So I was immediately selling it as fast as we could to these builders. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we did that for well, I mean, that that grew into us going to the actual tax sales and buying properties, because what would happen is we'd get a few vacant lots on a on a block. And they were like, it'd be nice if we had those three houses also on that block. So we'd go to the tax sale and eventually get those. Well, now there's houses in there with people in there. And those became rental units over time. And and I do that until I got an entire block. Of course, if I have a contiguous block, that's extremely valuable to a developer. But in the meantime, I'm I'm hoarding all these homes and I have tenants in them. And and then that led to us buying, you know, better rental units. Yeah. And then eight years later, we have 650 houses with tenants in them then, let's, you know. let's talk about that transaction there and, and how that went down um so because it sounds like it kind of evolved from just flipping to developers once you had possession of the property to now you started to actually hold some of the properties they had tenants in them so how, how did that kind of evolve and what were the challenges in that evolution yeah was, we 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 we're buying so much stuff. We, you always need more money. And of course, uh, you know, I have family. I had a, I had a brother that was uh, in San Diego at the time and they had taken a small company public and they were looking for something else to do. So we were kicking around this idea. And again, this is, 
you know, middle 2000s, 03, 04, 05, when real estate's just booming, especially in the places like San Diego. So he was seeing friends that were selling duplexes, you know, in San Diego and making a million dollars. And now they need to park that money somewhere. So he knew what I was doing. And over time, we just started talking and we were essentially doing a huge volume of 1031 exchanges mostly from California sellers. And over time, we had investors, even down in Mexico and Cuba, it got pretty big. But essentially, we were a, a 1031 haven for people. And it's funny, at that time, these guys in California, they were making so much money on these transactions. They, they would come to our office and say, look, I don't even need to make money. I just don't want to lose money. So they were wanting to park a million bucks in Houston where you know, we're not appreciating like this. It's just a very slow 2% year after year, very steady. <clears throat> so then I'm now doing 1031 exchanges. Well, if a guy comes in from California with a million bucks, I can buy at least 10 properties in, in Houston, right? So that became a whole, well, now I'm not looking for vacant lots anymore. I, I need, to vi- need to buy an income producing property viable, uh, so my, my focus began to, to move towards the rental houses pretty quickly. How would you structure those 1031s? Cause the, the property would be titled in their name. And then did you do all the, the management? Do you have like a management agreement or? Yeah. Yeah. So this is when, and this, this whole story doesn't do me any good either. Uh, again, I'm still young and I'm definitely stupid. Um, I'm ambitious. But uh, <laughs> in hindsight, right, because tw- 2008 is looming, right? We don't yeah. know what's about to hit us, but it is coming. <clears throat> in the meantime, we're just making money hand over fist, and we all think we're geniuses. But we were essentially, we were buying properties, doing 1031 exchanges. You're correct. They're titled in the, the new investor. Uh, I created a, a huge warehouse line with Texas Capital Bank up in Dallas. So we had a $70 million line that we would that we were basically using to finance these investors coming in. So now a guy would come in with a million bucks and lever it up and he could buy a lot of properties. And then we were doing a, a basically a master lease. So he would buy those 10 properties. We would agree to manage it. And we had we had a terms in there because we were we were trying to get a piece of that appreciation as well so we had these complicated terms that was again in hindsight uh a mistake but at the end of the day we were a huge property management company and a lot of these rental units were our own as well but uh yeah when when 2008 hit we had 66 investors about 70 million dollars worth of real estate under our our roof uh and even, even 08, we did 150 transactions. So the whole crisis really didn't affect Texas for almost 18 months later. And that's because we, we we didn't get this huge appreciation like Arizona and Florida and uh, California was getting. What eventually doomed Texas was the whole financing pendulum. You know, there was the uh, easy money, right? Uh Anyone could get a loan, which is one of the reasons 2007, 2008 happened. The pendulum swung the other way where banks weren't lending on anything. And they sure as hell weren't going to lend on a bunch of low-end rental units in Houston. So in, in one day, I got a call from the president of Texas Capital Bank, and he cut our line of credit from 70 to 7 in one day. And uh, I didn't know it at that time, but I was out of business right then. So I was like, that's fine. I'll go find some other money. We go to New York, we go to Chicago. Yeah. Nobody's lending anything. And then over time, even, even retail buyers in these little communities that want to buy an 80 or $90,000 house, there was nothing for them. No one would land on anything. So property values start falling. The investors are coming in paying cash. And that's when Houston just got smashed because there's there was for all intensive purposes there was no lending there certainly wasn't any subprime mm-hmm. so it was a 
yeah, it was a catastrophe. And of course, all these investors, they were trying to max out their leverage. So almost all of them were taking 90 LTV loans. Mm. And then anyway, a lot of other details there, but yeah, it got really ugly. And then I spent the next three years selling all these properties for all these people. And half of them were bankrupt, you know, whatever real estate that they owned in, you know, Las Vegas or whatever had already bankrupted all of them. So they were, they were hosed. It was, it was a real big, ugly mess. Sure. So when, when did the, uh, when did you start to see the light at the other end of the tunnel there? Like what, what happened? Uh, how did that evolve and into what you do today? Yeah, well, that's kind of cool because, you know, when God closes a door, he usually at least opens a window. And it was neat because there was a really cool window that opened up. But you, you're, the other side of your house is literally on fire. <laughs> so it was, it was really difficult to mm -hmm. try to do your best to seize this opportunity while you know not getting killed in the fire <laughs> but <laughs> so i got a, a random picture there i like i like the visuals are, are pretty good yeah. there yeah it was, it was horrifying um but i got a random phone call from a a, a guy in at, uh fannie mae in dallas and i wish i could remember his name uh so if, if this is a problem for little old me in Texas, it's a major problem for Fannie Mae, right? They're, they're looking at tens of thousands of defaults. So it is, I mean, blood is in the street at, at this time. So Fannie Mae is contemplating a massive rental scheme as they're, as they're taking all these properties back thousands and thousands and thousands but it's not a good time to sell anyone and or any of them and then if they did as large as fannie mae is they would exacerbate the problem flooding the market with even more inventory so so they thought it would be wise if there's some way they could stall and and by by renting them out you know allow themselves to afford to sell them into the future five years later when, when things calm down this is a good idea the problem is when, when he first called, he's like, yeah, we have 18,000 units we'd like to rent out right now. And the reason he called us is not that I'm a trendsetter, but let's be real, <laughs> right? No one had 650 single family rentals back in the time. Sure. So, so yeah, we, we can talk about Blackstone, American Homes for Rent, but man, they're, they were way late. Not really. I, I was early and they, they, they came in you, with- You were too same, early. I was way too early, <laughs> but it's, I mean, single family rentals, you got to have your stuff together. If you're going to have that kind of volume, it's, it's hard, but, but they came in at the perfect time. I mean, they, they were just mopping it up and I, I mm. shake my head. I, I was off by seven years mm -hmm. and it killed us. Like it, it completely wiped us out. Um, but anyway, uh, so Fannie Mae is trying to figure out this massive rental portfolio. And, you know, Texas is a big state, but not that many people have that type of, you know, 650 single family rentals. So they called, they wanted to know how, how we did it, if we'd be interested in consulting with them and figure out a way to lease out 18,000 units all across the country. So that's a pretty cool ask, right? To get a call sure. from Fannie I'm like, hmm. So we 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 had an office in San Diego. We bring in the guys and we're brainstorming how to how to handle this. And you know we're throwing out all kinds of ideas and, and working on it. We had we had two meetings with uh, Sean Donovan, who's the secretary of of HUD at the time. I mean, they were, this was very serious. And uh, I just feel like we were this close to getting it done, and then the election happened. Uh, what was it Bush was out? Obama was in everything we were working on got thrown in the trash can. Mm. So it was a really a pretty window. And we, we thought that that was going to save the day, uh, you know, come in and work with, with Fannie Mae, those, that type of volume would have been, that would have changed everything, but politics, right. It, so none of that happened, but Sean Donovan as a, a carrot, I guess, realizing that this probably isn't going to happen in the Obama administration. He he put us in touch with uh, 
I think his name was Craig Nickerson, who was the uh, he was the head of the NCST, the National Community Stabilization Trust. So they were also headquartered in Dallas. It was a brand new entity that was that was created out of the, the TARP bailout during the whole 2008 fiasco. Yeah. And the the NCST was a, a several large, I think it was five or six large national nonprofits. So they created this entity and their purpose was to be a clearinghouse for all the distressed assets that were coming down the pike, Fannie, Freddie, and then even the big lenders. Uh, Chase was a big one, uh, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. So they had this, this new big company in Dallas. They're getting all these assets and their purpose is to funnel them to other nonprofits or municipality municipalities to stabilize those assets. They didn't want them going back to the Wall Street people. They didn't want them to go back to local investors who were just going to flip them and continue to exacerbate the problem. They wanted firms to stabilize them, rent them out, get owner occupants in there, no investors, which is great. Mm. Uh, the nonprofits just didn't know how to do it. They couldn't raise the money. They didn't know how to renovate. They didn't know how to value a property and the, the construction costs in, involved and and they were just hemorrhaging money. So Craig Nickerson was was frustrated. So we actually came in as the first for-profit strategic partner of the NCST. And they, they kind of had this cool software program. It was almost like a trading platform. It's pretty neat. You could you could zoom in on any area of the map. It's like a Google Maps, and it had little uh, pins or flags for every asset that was available. And you, you click on that flag, it'll give you a little brief description of the property uh, and a price. And these were huge discounts. The, the, even though the market was crashed, these were you know, at least 20% discounts to a market transaction. And uh, so these nonprofits from all over the place, they would be buying these houses. And uh, the, the first, uh, he, uh, Nickerson gave us a spreadsheet just looking at all these transactions and, and they, they were horrible. Uh, these nonprofits would get stuck, you know, looking at a historic home on a corner and they, they just, they didn't want to do what needed to be done. So they, they paid too much for it, spend an ordinate amount of money on renovations and then sell it for 60% of their cost. So they were just, they were just losing money. It wasn't helping anybody. So we ended up getting tied in with 12 different nonprofits from Florida to California. And we basically took over that platform. We made all buy decisions. We raised the money for the construction and the purchase. We did the construction and then we would liquidate it all on behalf of whatever nonprofit. And uh, so there's, I don't know, probably a four year period of time. We did like 3,500 of those types of transactions. So as you're approaching you know, you're five years outside of the mess, <clears throat> those discounts began to shrink. So where we were getting, you know, big 20% discounts from, from Chase Bank, we were essentially paying, playing market at, by the time we decided this isn't working anymore. Uh, so by, by that time, I was in pretty heavy with uh, a nonprofit in Phoenix. And you've heard me mention Marcos many times. Uh, he's still there, the executive director. Uh, He's a good sharp business businessman. So we we did a lot of stuff together. But one thing that we we did was we began lobbying HUD. Since since the since the margins began to shrink, we thought let's go upstream. We know they're still foreclosing on thousands and thousands of these. What if we started buying the paper before it became an REO and then get that discount again? We didn't know anything about trading notes at the time, mm -hmm. so. HUD is a fairly uh, large nonprofit. We began lobbying HUD because they have sales usually two or three times a year. So they agreed. They said, we'll we'll set aside a group of loans in this next auction and uh, just for nonprofit bidders only. So they did. They set aside, it was like six or nine properties in Detroit, which is the last place anybody wanted to be buying anything in whatever that was, 2014. <coughs> So we were the only bidder. We bought them all for like $400,000. And uh, 
which is good. We we've learned how to slowly figure them out. We have, you know, they were all occupied by borrowers. So we're, you know, trying to figure out modifications or a deed in lieu or, or whatever. So we're, we're starting to learn and HUD seemed to like it. So the next auction comes around and they set aside an even bigger group and we were the only bidder. And then a couple of years later, they, they set aside an entire market in Chicago and they sold, I think there's a little over a hundred, uh, 70 transacted. We bought all of them. Six months after that, another one in Chicago comes up and there's 89. And we bought all of those. Again, we're the only bidder. No one else is doing this. Mm -hmm. But now we have some volume. Like these are like real dollars that are have. It's not 400 grand anymore. There's it's millions sure. of dollars. And and yeah, we're quickly trying to figure out how to work through. Uh, and again, these are all forwards, you know, not the heckums we're buying now. So we're dealing with borrowers. We're modifying loans. Uh, we're short selling or whatever we have to do. And uh, and now an average set aside, well, now 50% of everything that HUD sells is set aside for nonprofit bidders only. So the auction that's looming here, December 5th, there's 1,500 loans. So 750 will be set aside for nonprofit bidders only. So it went from nine units in Detroit to 750 across the country. That'll be a $100 million trade. So what it, year it's, was that? Like what? What year did it all did that all start? Like the first Detroit deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it was 2014 or 2015. All right, so it's roughly a little less than 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So it's come a long way. Yeah, pretty fast. <laughs> so what do you like today? Now, what do you what do you see as the uh, as the future and? Uh, and then what do you see like the combination with you, you know, working with us on the single family rental side where it seems like maybe you're getting back to some of your, your roots in that sense. And I mean, what, what do you, let's talk about that for a little bit. Well, I, I mean, we're thinking about the rental side, you know, now that we're buying so many Heckums as well. Um, HUD stopped selling forward mortgages when Trump was elected and they have not sold a single forward since then. So what are we talking about? Seven years now? Seven well, years HUD hasn't yeah, sold a forward right. mortgage. That's a that's a long time. So th things like that make me nervous. Like they have to be sitting on a lot of non-performing forwards. But they, they don't like the idea of you know foreclosing, uh, which I, I don't understand, I, whatever. Um, they're not selling forwards. So they did start selling Heckums, but now you're dealing with a deceased borrower. So I guess no one could get mad if you foreclose on someone that passed away. But yeah, we, we, we're we getting our, there's no modifications, right? So everything comes back to us eventually. And now I have a vacant physical structure I need to deal with. And and when, you, when you're looking at our environment now <clears throat> from a, real estate perspective <clears throat> from a single family perspective <clears throat> the supply of inventory it is a historic low so when i'm able to buy a bunch of loans a bunch of vacant assets from hud it, it i hate selling them right it selling them it delivers dollars right but then that kind of creates another problem what am i going to do with these dollars do i want to go in the market not not a lot not right now. I mean, we could buy bonds or something or whatever, but where where are my expertise where I could make those dollars more valuable? Uh, I, I just I keep coming back to single family rentals. Like I don't want to buy multi. Commercials dying. Uh, definitely not retail. But there's this huge shortage of single families. Let's sell less of them. Keep more of them turn them into rentals. Uh, I mean, to me, that's the brightest thing I can think of doing. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're now with this, with the, well, the last two auctions we, we won, uh, we're converting a higher and higher percentage into rentals, which is what we're doing at GSP already. But yeah, I, I just don't see, I mean, there's, there always can be a downside, but I, I just, it seems very limited. We were with our capital partners last week there in Philadelphia, and, and we were playing war games with 
you know, okay, say we have 100 rental units, <clears throat> we've refinanced, rates are high, so may maybe you have a 7% mortgage right now or whatever. So our, you know, maybe our monthly profit is is shrinking. It's not like what we're doing in Baltimore. So maybe making 250 bucks a month. The problem is most of these, if we just sell them, I could book 60 grand in profit. Why would I not just take that money? You know, you look at 60 grand now or $250 a month. Sure. You know, most people would say, take the 60 grand. <laughs> yeah. But then, but then what are you going to do with that money? So we, this is one of the, the conversations we had this last week. So I said, okay, let's just pretend. Let's say we, we refinance that same asset that we're going to rent. We, we don't sell it. We refinance. We get all of our money back. We might even get a little bit more. But let's say we break even. So 100% of our cash is out. We still own the house. We have a tenant in there. We're making $250 a month. And then do some very conservative assumptions. Property appreciates 2% 2, 2 a year. I think that's pretty conservative right now. And, and the tenant is paying down my mortgage by one point a year. So that's three point a year, three, three points of equity we gain mm -hmm. every year. And let's just draw this out for five years. So now we're talking about 15 points plus the rent we've been making for five years. If you do that, it doubles that $60,000 we could have made had we just sold it. And I have all my money back. Hmm. So the first 60 grand, I, I I had risk involved, a fair amount of risk, right? I'm, I'm buying something. I've got money riding on it. But that, but when it doubles that that next five years, it's house money. I got a non-recourse yeah. loan. I have all my money back. Why why wouldn't I take that that deal? So capital came back and said, Yeah, but what if what if interest rates are 10 in five years? Which I mean could be. That's gonna push push down the value of the property, right? That's what we keep saying. Although that's not what has been happening. Sure. We've yeah. watched ourselves go from four to wherever we are now. And because of the supply issue property values continue to rise now at some point that's going to change is it going to change by the time we hit 10 maybe but it only affects me if i sell so five years from now the market the environment is 10 percent, but i have a fixed seven and a tenant my rents are going up because everything is going up i feel pretty good about things i'll just keep holding it mm -hmm juxtapose that to what if rates are six now now my property value is way up yeah right i refi if i need to at a better rate make a little more money tax-free money so i don't know like where does that really go south where, where what can i do in that situation by extending that whole time out five six seven years where do i get hurt <laughs> Unless something magnificent happens in the in the economy, you know, a, a major war, a, a huge crash, and unemployment rises, uh, but then you got all kinds of problems everywhere, right? The, you're you're not going to be protected no matter what. So I, I don't. It's it's hard. You can't plan, I guess, if you're worried about some massive anomaly, which they happen, right? But. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, I, it's I, interesting, you know, and I'm just I'm listening to you and and you're kind of going through, you know, these situations in your head. Did a lot of that come from, you know, just your experience over the years, especially with 2008? Like, do you think if you were in your shoes today, 10 years ago, you probably wouldn't be thinking half the things you're thinking? Because like you're kind of going through all these scenarios and I'm thinking that this is like this is coming from, you know, the the wisdom and experience you've gained over the years. And maybe, you know, things you probably didn't do back in the 08 days where you were just things were chugging along. And, you know, like you said, it's just uh, things were fine until until they weren't kind of a thing. Maybe you yeah. didn't take the time to think about those those kinds of what yeah, could I, happen scenarios. Yeah, I was too dumb. to. I, I didn't even know what to look for or expect. It's just ignorance, you know. But but now, like, I would never do a 90 LTV loan. You know, <laughs> not not even now. But so if you look at most of our refis, we're at 70%. Okay, so what's going to cause a market to take a 30% hickey? It would be catastrophic. That's that's for sure. But in a way, 
I'm in a different situation now with our capital too, right? So even if there was a big catastrophic event right now, or right, you know, I would be a buyer. Like back then I couldn't be a buyer. I was wiped out. I would be a buyer. Yeah. Right. So it's not, not that I want such a thing because it would hurt the assets we're holding, but <clears throat> we're in a better position to raise capital to be a buyer in those types of situations than I was for sure. You know, whatever that was 15 years ago. So yeah, it's funny you say that because I was, when you were telling that the story of 08 and what happened, I was thinking the same thing. If only you could have somehow gotten the capital together to be on the buying side of it. Uh, it just seemed like there was an amazing opportunity there. And it's quite interesting that you, how you've positioned yourself today that even in, in that scenario, you still have access to capital that can that can take advantage of those opportunities. Well, and I hope so. I mean, that, you, I mean, I you never know if something gets ugly, they could all be off the table. Sure. But yeah. I just I didn't have that access. But you're right; it was a magnificent opportunity. And then you see all these Blackstone American Homes for Rent that just I mean, holy cow! I'm laying flat on my back, and these guys are just making money hand over fist. They're soaking up everything. So yeah, it was a it was a game changer. And then now you have all these big, massive rental portfolios across the country, single family, that no one really ever, it wasn't a thing before. Multifamily, but no one had tens of thousands of single family. Yeah, That's crazy. Yeah, I think 90,000 homes for invitation yeah. homes alone. It's, and yeah, yeah it's totally commonplace now. But... Hmm. Well, th this was a absolutely fascinating conversation with uh, just I think we went down. So we, we talked about so many different things from cattle to hotels and you know, notes and single family and construction. And, you know, I feel like we could have picked any of any one of these topics and, and zoomed in and kind of, you know, taken each one of them a little further. But I think this was a great conversation starter into giving everybody a little bit more window into your experience and what you've gone through over the years and how they've shaped the the person and the investor you are today. Um, so I think this was a great conversation and uh, maybe on future podcasts, we can, you know, just kind of zoom into any one of these topics in a little bit more detail. But for now, I think um, this was a, a great introduction and overview and, um, let's maybe pick it up on a, on a future podcast, but you know, I appreciate you and, uh, and I coming together for this one, uh, without Mr. Ron and we will, uh, we'll maybe the three of us will be together on the next one. Okay. Sounds good. Appreciate it, Peter. Awesome. Well, there you have it. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. Be sure to subscribe and join us live on one of our virtual meetups. You can find more information on our website at gsprei.com. That's gsprei.com. Thank you again and God bless. We'll look forward to catching you on the next one.